Hello everybody, welcome back to my series of American Horror Story recaps. Today we're going to be focusing on one of the worst seasons, I would say, and that would be Apocalypse, or as I like to call it, a flop lips, because this season is such a flop. You can disagree with me, but I personally despise this season. It got my hopes up to the point where I was expecting something like Avengers Endgame level. It just did not deliver. It didn't deliver, unfortunately. So, unfortunately, Apocalypse suffers from a major issue. It doesn't know what the fuck is going on half the time. The plot is so convoluted. The characters make no sense. And as you can see with the 5,000 fucking characters we have to deal with, it is a very messy season. Very messy and not messy in the way that's good. It becomes so difficult to explain to somebody if you've never even actually seen the season. And I really did think that Roanoke was going to do me in. But I think this might be the season because what actually happened in this season? Not much, actually. There is one episode in this entire season that I actually like. One. Mm -hmm. One out of ten. Mm -hmm. That's embarrassing. It is not hard to please me when it comes to American Horror Story. I have sat through a lot of shit with this TV show. And the fact that I only like one episode this entire season, girl, bye. And as you can see, the timeline starts down here, and we're gonna get into that. What were the writers thinking? What were Ryan Murphy, Brad Falchuk, what were, what was the team thinking? What, why did they decide to tell this completely out of order? Why did they decide to have one storyline take place in the first three episodes, and then another Another storyline take place in the next like seven or eight. I don't understand. This season could have been so fucking good because this, if you didn't know, is the crossover, the major crossover between two different seasons, technically three if we want to get technical. The show's done crossovers before, but this is like a season of crossover. Like this is like the entire season is built around this crossover. And let me just tell you, it sold no units in my book. It sold absolutely nothing. So a few years ago when this season first came out, I think it was maybe like a year or two after it came out, I made a terrible, by the way, terrible video essay about this. It's on private now, you can't see it. I basically explained all the reasons why this season is ass. Most of it has to do with the plot and the writing and the terrible characters. I am specifically talking about these fuckheads up here. Yeah, let's just try to get into explaining all these characters. It's gonna be a mess. Stick with me. I promise I'm gonna try and do my absolute best to get through this, but this season... So, right away, you're probably thinking, what the hell is this fucking shape you have going on? It does look very awkward looking, but I'm gonna explain in a second. Also, there are no lines because how the fuck would you even keep track of what's going on on this board if I did that. The characters are up, but there's no lines, so I'm sorry about that, but it would just be too convoluted to try and do that, especially with these side characters everywhere. It would make no fucking sense. So this season is a crossover between Coven and Murder House. So there are characters from Coven and Murder House in this season, but there's also a third plot line where there's this apocalypse that happens and we have a whole new cast of characters. So you have actors like Sarah Paulson, and Evan Peters, and Francis Conroy, and Taisia Formiga, all playing more than one character. Evan Peters plays four, four characters this season, all of which come from different seasons. What in the hell, what is going on in this fucking hellscape? Sarah Paulson plays three characters, and all three of them spend quite amount of time on screen. Top 10 ways to confuse your audience. Also, it is now occurring to me that I forgot Delphine Lalaurie on this board. She makes a quick cameo. She's in like maybe 30 seconds. So I believe that's the only major character that I missed. We have characters who appeared in Murder House. Technically, this character is unknown to the unknown viewer. You might not know who that is, but I'm going to get into it in a minute. And then in this center row, we have characters who are a part of Coven and Hotel because James Patrick March makes a small cameo from Hotel and I'll get into how that makes sense later. These four up here and her who are a part of the Coven storyline, but they didn't appear in the actual season. And then we have new characters. These are characters that were developed for Apocalypse. And as you can see, they take up quite, quite a big portion of the board. It's just insane. It's really crazy. I am just bamboozled, completely confused as to why they decided to do it this way. Evan Peters is technically credited as starring cast this season. However, none of his four 
characters really do that much this season, so I did not give any of them a big picture, because if I gave one of them a big picture, I feel like I would have to give the other ones a big picture. This character's only in like three episodes, this character's in one episode, or maybe two, this character's in one episode, and this character's in one episode. So if you think about it, they're really just crediting Evan Peters and not really his characters as mains. I am basically making up my own rules here because Francis Conroy is not credited as a main character this season, but Myrtle Snow deserves a big picture first of all, and second of all, she's in quite a number of episodes and makes a big impact on the plot still, so therefore I gave her a big picture. Whereas John Henry Moore, the flop that he is, is in like three or four episodes and he doesn't do anything. So he's not credited as main character in my head canon, but he is credited as main character in American Horror Story canon. The size of the character picture is not necessarily about who's a starring role, anymore because Ryan Murphy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about when he gives John Henry Moore main character status. Did I write any notes about any of these characters? No! I'm just gonna freeball it, I think. In this season, the apocalypse hits, okay? And that is because of Michael Langdon. If you remember, all the way back in Murder House, Michael Langdon is the son of Tate and Vivian Harmon because Tate R-worded her in the Rubber Man costume. She got pregnant with both Tate's and Ben's babies. Ben's baby died because Michael was too strong and got birthed way too early on in the process and Michael was like a perfectly healthy baby. Constance ended up taking him in and raising him from then on. So this whole season is basically his fault because he, as we know, is the anti Christ. He causes the apocalypse, and in episode one, we don't really see him yet, but we meet all these random fuck-ass characters that have nothing to do with Coven or Apocalypse. Everybody in this group, or at least the majority of them, are in a bunker called Outpost 3 after the Apocalypse. It's only like two or three weeks after the Apocalypse as of episode one. So, <clears throat> This is Miss Venable. This is my mother right here, by the way. Wilhelmina Venable, mm-hmm, with those candlesticks, mm-hmm. She absolutely fucking devours. Sarah Paulson serves, slays, eats down every single scene that she's in in this character. She's in charge of Outpost 3, but we know that she has scoliosis. She might be a little bit devious. This is Miss Miriam Mead. Now, Miriam Mead is her second in command, and the only thing we know about her so far was that she's ex-military. That's all we need to know about her right now. Right away. Dinah Stevens. She is one of the rich paying members of the people that ended up in this bunker. And we don't know much about her right away, but we will figure it out around episode seven. This is Mallory. Mallory is what they call a gray. Everyone else in this group is a purple, but Mallory is a gray and grays are the rich people who paid to be there. Grays are the people that were fortunate enough to get a spot handed to them. Basically, she's a slave to all these people. Next, we have Coco. She is Mallory's friend but also Mallory's employer because Mallory was her assistant pre-apocalypse. This is Coco's boyfriend. His name is Brock. Low impact character, by the way. This is Evie and Mr. Gallant. Mr. Gallant, played by Evan Peters, by the way, both join Coco and Mallory because Coco's family died and they had two spots left. So these two didn't pay their way in, but they did take Coco's family's spot. By the way, she's like ultra rich. Then we have Emily and Timothy, the floppiest of flops you could possibly imagine. These two were selected by the cooperative, who is the people that sanctioned these outposts, to continue the human race because their genes are superior to everybody else. Then we have these two fuck ass bitches with these fuck ass bowl cuts. They are the worst two characters in this entire series. They are two scientists and we're gonna get more into that later on. Moving down, we have the Warlock Council right here. They were not in Coven, but they know the girlies from Coven and the Coven girlies know them. They are basically the male versions of witches, the warlocks obviously, and they are basically always trying to take power away from the witches because the witches, as we know, Miss Mother Supreme right here, is in control of all the magic practitioners. Couldn't tell you half their names, to be honest with you. This is John Henry Moore. He's supposed to be a main character. And then we have this guy who has like one line. This guy, I believe his name is Behold. He fucking serves, but he's not in many episodes, so I didn't give him a main character picture. So these four, all you need to know about them is that they're warlocks and they're trying to take power away from the girlies. And all of 
them are gay, I believe. All of them are like in canon gay. Next we have Madison Montgomery. You already know, you already know. That's my mother right there. So she returned from Coven. We're gonna figure out how she's alive because if you remember, she was strangled by Kyle in the season finale of Coven. So we're gonna get into that. Next we have Cordelia mother. She is the supreme as of the beginning of this season. Next we have Myrtle, mother as well. Right here we have the trilogy of mothers. Mm -hmm. This is my mother, this is my mother, and this is my mother. So next we have some characters from Coven who were credited as main characters in Coven, but in this season they don't do anything so I did not give them big pictures. Zoe, Marie Laveau, Misty, Nan, and Queenie. Most of those characters are dead as of Coven besides Zoe. Queenie was also alive as of Coven, but she went to the Hotel Cortez in Hotel, so she's dead as of Hotel. Then we have James Patrick March, and if you remember, he's from Hotel. We're gonna get a quick little cameo from him. And yeah, as I said before, Michael, he's the Antichrist. And we have returning main characters. All of these girlies were mains. We have Violet, Moira, Ben, Vivian, Tate, Billy Dean Howard, and last but certainly not least, the return of the mother of all mothers, Constance Langdon. And this would be her final, mm -hmm, this would be her actual final appearance in this TV show. She devours, she absolutely fucking devours this season. It's a good farewell to her, a second farewell to her. That was a lot of characters to get through. I am gonna go take a sip of water. All right, so I've already kind of explained the characters and how that is all broken down, but the timeline is also confusing. So let me get into that. So this season is kind of like previous seasons where it's told out of order. We saw that a lot with Colt. We saw it a little bit with Roanoke, but this season takes it to a new level because the first three episodes, and this isn't really a spoiler, whatever, I'm just gonna get into it. And this is kind of a spoiler, so I'm just gonna say it now. The first three episodes focus solely on all of these girls. There's not a single character from here below in the first three episodes. So this season is told completely out of order. The first three episodes take place towards the end of the timeline. And then we get like five or six episodes where the entire storyline takes place like three to four years earlier than that. And that's why there's so much empty space up here because there's so many flashbacks. So these girlies all exist in 2020. It is April 14th, day 1027. Mm -hmm. Not day one, day 1027 when this season starts. I'm so sorry to do that to you, but that is just how this is going to work. There's no other good way to do it. So this is how we're doing it. Um, day 1027, it is April 14th, 2020. And Brian Murphy, he kind of knew that there was going to be an apocalypse in spring of 2020. He did, because look what happened two years after this season was released. We meet <clears throat> Coco St. Pierre Vanderbilt and Mallory. She doesn't get a last name. So these two are, they don't look like this right now. They're just normal right now. The apocalypse has not happened yet. And they are going to her hairdresser's salon to get her a new haircut. Her hairdresser is none other than Mr. Gallant right here, played by Evan Peters. She's like a D-list celebrity, by the way. She is an influencer. She is taking pictures and videos for her Instagram. And all of a sudden they get this warning on their phone, or I guess it's more of like an alert from the government that basically says that the apocalypse is on babes. Mm -hmm. You better find shelter because there's not going to be much to live off of once the bombs come. Thor, everybody starts freaking the fuck out. There's chaos in the streets. These three all run home and get their affairs in order. Um, there's people running around, people dying, people killing themselves, people getting hit by cars, just a bunch of random ass shit going on. So we see this guy, Mr. Gallant, go to his grandma's house and try to get her and try to get her ready for what's coming. And he brings her to Coco, who has a space open for this bunker and they are taken to the bunker. Mallory takes the fourth spot via private jet. Then we meet this man and he has just got accepted to college and all of a sudden him and his family get the alert that there is an apocalypse happening when these people in black suits come in and take him saying that his DNA is gonna save the world. So he is kidnapped by these girlies in black suits and taken to 
this holding area. There he meets this girl named Emily. We then skip down two weeks. It is April 28th, day 1041. Emily and Timothy are taken to the outpost because they were in a holding cell for two weeks and then it was finally deemed safe for them to be brought to this outpost where they meet Miss Mead, Benable, Coco, Mallory, Dinah, Dinah's son who I didn't put on the board, a couple of other people, and then Mr. Gallant and his grandma. That's everybody that's in this bunker. It's literally like maybe 20 30 people at most. However, there is really ugly orange ass lighting. It kind of just like destroys any scene to be honest with you. The next day, Mr. Gallant and a flop character named Stu, who we don't really know anything about, they are both taken to get a decontamination shower because they were both caught for going outside, but Apparently neither of them did go outside and it was just her turning up the sensitivity on the radiation detector So yeah, they are both given a decontamination shower and one of them still tests Positive for the radiation and so Miss Mead just fucking shoots him in the head and he dies right then and there and later that day everybody um, is sitting and eating dinner. They're given this mysterious stew. One of them realizes that the stew is literally made of stew. They are literally now all cannibals. We then jump down quite, quite a bit. It is now day 1588. So a whole 18 months later, by the way, mm -hmm. it is October 27th, 2021. Yes, October 27th, 2021. All of them look absolutely destroyed. Their hair is all fucked up. They look tired as fuck because they've literally just been waiting for this so-called cooperative to come and save them. Uh -huh. A mysterious, mysterious man on horseback arrives and enters the bunker claiming to be part of the cooperative. This man is Michael Langdon. All right, so that's the end of episode one. Not a whole lot happens. It's really one of my least favorite premiere episodes because I don't give a flying fuck about anybody in this top two rows. So in this episode, Michael, who claims to be part of this cooperative, has arrived and we carry on from the last episode still. It is day 1588. It is October 27th, 2021 still. Michael claims to Venable that he is a part of this cooperative. She acts a little shocked because she believes that the cooperative was all dead. Basically, it is revealed that Venable has been making up all these awful rules like no sex, the whole gray versus purple thing, the whole you must be dressed for every single event thing. She basically made it all up and Michael confronts her on this and proceeds to say that he's going to interview everybody in this bunker and see who is fit to bring with him to the sanctuary where there's better resources and food and everything that's actually available for them. He has the rubber man have sex with Mr. Gallant. This causes Evie, who is Mr. Gallant's grandma, to tattle on him because there's a whole no sex rule. This causes Mr. Gallant to go and try and kill the rubber man who he thinks is Michael. Does that make any sense? And while he's trying to kill the rubber man, it's revealed that he's actually killing his grandma. The grandma's dead now. This carries on to day 1589, it is October 28th, the next day. Oh, also we have these two flop characters have sex for the first time, but they're caught by Mead. So they are about to be taken outside when Mead is shot by Timothy because Timothy takes the gun off one of the guards. And it's revealed that Miriam Mead is bleeding this white pus shit. And she has like, she has like wires coming out of her. So that can't be good. We're gonna figure out what that means in the next episode. All right, so episode three opens with a series of flashbacks in Miriam Mead's life. October 31st, 1962, October 31st, 1968, and October 31st, 1988. So all of those fall on Halloween because this is the Halloween episode. We get a couple of scenes where um, young Miriam Mead dresses up as Rosie the Robot. Then we get a scene of her as a teenager and she goes on her first date and watches Rosemary's Baby. Then we get a scene where it's about 20 years later, she is a Mossad agent and makes her first kill. Anyway, back to the present day, it is day 1590, October 29th, 2021. Michael has continued interviewing people 
and he gets to Mallory and during this interview, Mallory is all shaken up over something and all of a sudden when Michael confronts her and is all up in her face about everything, she sets the room on fire. It is now the next day, October 30th, which would be day 1591. So Mead realizes that she is a robot, yes, like an AI robot, and she had a past life before she became a robot, like a human life. She says that there was a boy that she used to care for ages and ages and ages ago. And I'm just confused how the fuck she has this woman's consciousness and memories. I completely glossed over the fact that Brock even existed. In the first episode, I completely forgot to explain this to you. He is Coco's boyfriend and she leaves him behind in the apocalypse. We catch up with Brock a whole 18 months later and he is all deformed mutant looking man. We get a few scenes with him as he makes his way to Outpost 3. He is trying to get revenge on his girlfriend Coco for not letting him in the bunker. Also, Venable has announced to everybody that at midnight they are going to have a Halloween soiree. Michael basically denies Venable passage to the sanctuary, saying that, you know, you made up your own rules, girl. That's basically a violation of cooperative rules. You were supposed to do things as we told you and you made up your own rules, so you're not coming to the sanctuary. Mead comes up with a plan to poison everybody at the Halloween party, including Michael, with these poisoned apples. So yeah, the soiree tomorrow is really just an excuse for them to poison everyone. So at the Halloween soiree, Brock has somehow made it into this bunker, and he comes, he comes in, wears a hood, and seduces Coco. Coco, believing that it is Michael, goes into a separate room with him because they are all in masks, I believe, or at least some of them are in masks, only for him to take his mask off and reveal that he is still alive. Then he takes a knife and shoves it straight into her head. So Coco dies, and back at the Halloween soiree party extravaganza, Venable and Mead have everybody bob for apples, and those apples, as I said before, are poisoned. So they all eat them at the same time and every singular person in this outpost drops dead besides Michael who's in his own room and besides these two who are the ones who orchestrated the whole situation. So Mead and Venable go after Michael who is in his own separate room. Venable orders Mead to shoot Michael. However, Michael then turns the tables on Miss Venable and has Mead shoot Venable. Now you may be asking yourself, what? How is that possible? Well, that is because this android is Michael's android. Mm -hmm. And the boy that she remembers is Michael. Every single person up here is dead besides Mead, who is a robot. So I guess you could say there's no humans up here alive. Cut to the chaos outside the walls. And at this point, if you don't know that this is a coven murder house crossover, you're probably confused as fuck. Basically, the plot is all wrapped up and we have seven episodes left. You know, we have these two still alive and you're like, how the fuck are they going to continue on a season with only two characters? The witches survived the apocalypse. We see these three make their way into Outpost 3 and they revive Coco, Mallory, and Dinah Stevens. Nobody else, just these three. And we will figure out what that means in episode four. <laughs> All right, so episode four carries on from episode three. It is again day 1592 on Halloween night 2021. As I said before, everybody up here is dead. These three have been resurrected randomly by these three who have arrived to Outpost 3. Mm -hmm. Then it is revealed that these three are witches. They have identity spells on them to prevent them from realizing their power. And this was hinted in last episode when Mallory set the room on fire and she didn't know how the fuck that happened. Yeah, it's because she's a witch. And Dinah, who has memories of being a witch, sides with Michael and says that she's not going to help any of these girlies take him down. <clears throat> Michael walks in and says, how can any of you destroy me when I've already won? The apocalypse has happened. Mead at his side and then it cuts to the intro and then after the intro it cuts to day one, June 23rd, 
2017. And this is what the rest of the season is, babes. So we officially meet the human version of Miriam Mead, and she is with child Michael Langdon. Now, if you remember, Michael Langdon was born in 2012, and the last time we saw him was in 2015. By my count, he should only be about five, but he looks like he could be about 20. So we're gonna get some explanation as to why that is later on. And he has been taken in by Miriam Mead, who is a Satanist, and they are out trying to acquire a goat's head for their spells and incantations and shit. Michael gets really upset at this guy at the store for disrespecting his devil mom. So he basically chokes the life out of this guy and he dies. And Michael is caught, sent to prison. We get this random ass introduction to these gays up here and they are the warlock council. I think I explained it earlier, but they are the male version of the witches. They get word about this guy, Michael, and believe that he could be the quote, Alpha, so basically the male version of Cordelia, who is the Supreme. Also keep in mind, these four run a school for boys who are warlock, and this school just so happens to be in the exact same building that Outpost 3 is set in. So we know that this school was turned into a outpost later on, but right away, for right now, in 2017, it's being used as a boys' school. It's now day three, June 25th, 2017. We see Ariel go to Michael's jail cell and release him from jail and bring him to the Warlock School. We skip down a whole month later, day 33, July 25th, 2017. The Warlock Council tests Michael on his abilities and he passes every single test. Not quite the test of the Seven Wonders, he does pass all of the tests that are given to him, which surpass all of these girlies in ability. The next day, it is now day 34, July 26th, 2017. The Warlock Council call Cordelia, Myrtle, and Zoe, and we still don't know why or how Myrtle was resurrected, but we'll learn later on. They go all the way to California, where this bunker is, and they learn of Michael and the supposed Alpha, she basically scoffs at this. All the girls basically scoff at this because there's no man warlock that can surpass a woman who is a witch in power. We get a flashback to November 24th, 2015, where Cordelia travels to the Hotel Cortez and attempts to free Queenie, but is unable to. After hearing about this, Michael travels to the Hotel Cortez to free Queenie from the hellscape that is the Hotel Cortez. And by the way, the set does not look anywhere as good as it did in Hotel because I believe they actually didn't reuse it. I think they honestly just reused the room set and then the hallway set. It also just doesn't feel like the Hotel Cortez because they don't use film cameras anymore. It kind of feels cheap. It really does feel like the cheap version of the Hotel Cortez. But anyway, he runs into James Patrick March and Queenie who are playing cards and he resurrects Queenie and does what Cordelia could not do. And this is when Michael is able to free Queenie and he brings her back with him. Then Michael travels to, then Michael travels to Madison Montgomery's personal hell, which is her working in retail. He ends up making a deal with his dad, <clears throat> Satan, to free her and bring her back in order to get leverage over the girls on the witch council. And at the end of the episode, we see Michael arriving with Queenie and Madison, which freaks the fuck out of Cordelia, so much so that she faints. <laughs> So Mallory, it is revealed, is a witch here at this academy and she resurrects a dead animal and not only resurrects it, but like brings it back to being a child. And this is something that Myrtle has never seen before. Myrtle believes Mallory to be the next Supreme. All right, so episode five begins with Michael undergoing the tests of the Seven Wonders because Cordelia has agreed to let the council give it a shot, even though she is hesitant about it. But once she sees him resurrect Madison and Queenie, she needs to let him do it or else it would kind of be seen as unfair to Michael. So she lets him do it and 
she adds a little second task onto it. Michael must not only go to hell and bring himself back, which would be the test of dissension if he forgot from Coven, he must also go to hell and bring back Misty Day, who Cordelia misses very much. Michael does succeed, and by the way, this is on day 46, August 7th, and day 47, August 8th. Cordelia then sends Madison and Behold to where Michael grew up in order to gather intel on him, and it just so happens that the place he grew up was the murder house. Mm -hmm. So we learn now that the big crossover that this season has promised is going to be happening in the next episode, episode six, titled Return to Murder House. All right, so episode six is the famous American Horror Story Coven and Murder House crossover episode. Let me tell you, it's a little bit disappointing, but it's also a really good episode. And it is the only episode in this season that I actually like. Every other episode this season kind of feels a little bit boring, if I'm being honest with you. This is like the first season that I really just do not like and I can't really find much to like in because they're just trying to do so much that it all just feels like it doesn't really matter. And when you hear about the end, you're gonna feel that way even more. Cordelia sends Madison and Behold to the murder house. It is now day 50, August 11th, 2017. Madison and Behold arrive at the murder house and they have now bought it, pretending to be a lovely couple trying to start a family. So they cast a spell which allows them to see the spirits within the house. The next morning they are found by Billy Dean Howard who arrives. Billy Dean Howard comes in and comes out of the house every so often. This is five years after the events of Murder House. So the original events that happened to these girlies five years later. Billy Dean tells them that she is one of the only people that this house actually allows to come and go, and they are in trouble if they don't get the hell out. Mother Constance comes down the stairs, and this would be the first time that Jessica Lange has graced our screens since Freak Show, and she absolutely still is devouring. So basically this whole episode is literally just like an interview from Behold and Madison to Constance, so a lot of the plot this episode is just Constance kind of trauma dumping and like explaining her past with Michael and how he lost his way. Constance, however, says that she is not going to tell them anything about Michael unless they get rid of Moira, who is still trapped in this house. So Madison goes out and digs up her bones and they go and bury her in her mother's grave. So this is a nice little exit for Moira. They return to the house and Constance gives up all the information she has on Michael. We get a series of flashbacks that this episode incorporates into its plot, starting on October 10th, 2015. So Constance is explaining to these two girlies, Michael, and how he literally aged 10 years overnight. And this freaks the fuck out of Constance. She thinks that, you know, not only just be a killer, he's probably the Antichrist. Then on October 15th, 2015, Constance realizes that Michael might, might be satanic. So she hires a priest to try and snuff out all of the darkness in him. This just ends with Michael killing this priest. Constance feels as though she is just never gonna stop burying dead bodies that Michael kills, so she realizes that she has failed as a mother. So she goes to the one place she knows that she can finally rest, and that would be the murder house. So she gets in with these girlies, she kills herself, so Constance, it is revealed, is now a ghost in the house from 2015 onward. It is again day 51, August 12th. Constance says that she wishes she could tell the girlies more, but that's all that she knows about him. So then she joins Tate and her son Beauregard and a mystery girl that we've never seen before. If you remember back in Murder House, Constance claimed to have four kids and we only saw three of the four. And so this mystery girl just so happens to be the fourth child. And I believe her name is Rose and she has black eyes. So I'm not entirely sure what that's about. Uh, they don't ever explain it. So yeah, Constance goes off into the sunset with Tate and 
and her other two children and is finally at peace. We then see Ben come into the room. Yes, Ben Harmon. He tells a good portion of the story to Madison and Behold about how Michael continued to lose his way after Constance died. We get a flashback to the 25th of October. Michael has discovered that Tate is his father and he tries to get close to Tate. However, according to Ben, Tate wants absolutely nothing to do with him because he's a spawn of Satan. And this just kind of feels a little unserious to me because back in season one, that was his whole goal was to have a child with Vivian. And it kind of just feels as though the writers forgot what they wrote back in season one. So that's a little nitpick on my part. We learned from Ben that he tried to shape Michael into being a better person, but it was just not going to work out really because he was predestined to be anti-Christ. We then see around the same time, Michael killing these two girls that move into the house and obliterates their, he obliterates their souls and like they just, they're no longer ghosts in the house. Back to the present day, Ben says that he wishes he could tell Madison and behold more. And out of nowhere comes Vivian who has stopped talking to Ben ever since Ben tried to be a good father figure to Michael. And she says that they need to work out their problems but first she wants to tell Madison and behold the rest of the story. So we learn on Halloween night, 2015, Michael is visited in the murder house by these Satanists, one of them being Miriam Mead, the human version, and he is taken under their wing, quite literally gets Michael to participate in this human sacrifice ritual where he has to eat this bitch's heart. So Vivian tries to kill Michael with a simple knife and that's just not going to work, babes. So Michael tries to erase her soul like he did to the new house owner. However, Tate saves her and this is supposed to be Tate's redemption arc, whatever. I still think he's a fucking awful piece of shit. So then we go back to the present day. It's day 51 again, August 12th, and Madison and Behold have quite enough information now on their new Supreme to know that he is the Antichrist and that he should not be anywhere near the throne because he is just gonna end up ending the world. So they uh, leave to go tell Cordelia everything, but before they do, they reunite Violet with Tate. Now these two live happily ever after together in the murder house. As if he didn't R word her mom and gaslight her for an entire season. And you know, be the cause of all of this to happen in the first place, but that's besides the point. And that's essentially where episode six ends. <laughs> All right, so episode seven gives us the reveal. It is now, by the way, a whole month after the Murder House episode. It is day 95, September 25th, 2017. Cordelia approaches the new queen of voodoo, who happens to be Dinah Stevens, and she tries to gain Dinah's support in taking the Antichrist down because she's going to need the combined powers of the witches and the voodoos in order to do this. And seeing as though Marie Laveau is still in hell, Dinah Stevens um, rejects Cordelia's offer, but tells her that she can try and contact Papa Legba in order to help defeat Michael. However, when she contacts Papa Legba, also contacts Nan, it is real that Nan is Papa Legba's henchwoman and she does whatever he asks and she causes all kinds of mischief down there and is much happier doing that than coming back to the land of the living. So Papa Legba then agrees to help her so long as she gives all of the witches' lives at the academy to her which she abruptly says no to and ends the contact. We then skip down to day 215. It is now January 23rd, 2018. A few months after the last part of the episode, Madison tries to get the support of Bubbles, who is an actress in Hollywood and also a witch. Apparently they had worked together on a couple of projects before. Bubbles reunites with Myrtle, and one week later, it is day 222, January 30th, so a whole week later, Myrtle and Bubbles go to the Warlock School, and they read the minds of Ariel and Baldwin figure out that they are planning to take these girlies down. It is the next day, January 31st, 
which would be day 223, Coco accidentally um, suffocates on a piece of food and dies. So Mallory uses her ability to bring her back to life. This impresses the girls at the Academy, including Zoe, so much that she believes Mallory might be the next Supreme. So not only does Myrtle believe this now, but Zoe does as well. The next day, it is day 224, February 1st of 2018. Mallory is given the test of the seven wonders and proves that she is the next Supreme. So we not only have Michael who has passed the test of the seven wonders, but now we have Mallory who has also passed the test. It's revealed that Cordelia is getting sick and she is, somebody is taking her power. And this is what leads them to give Mallory this test because her powers are beginning to blossom. She passes the tests, which confirms to them that they need to take Michael and the Warlocks down because they will be fine with killing him because they have the Supreme of their own now. So we see Coco capture Mead. We see Ariel and Baldwin are captured by Cordelia and Myrtle because if you remember earlier on in the episode, Myrtle was able to prove with Bubbles that they were plotting against the witches. And we see that all three of these girlies are burned at the stake and that is basically where we leave episode seven. Episode 8 is one of my absolute least favorite episodes, so I'm going to try and gloss over it as much as I possibly can because I don't care that much. I really don't. After discovering that his warlock council minus Behold and John Henry Moore, and as well as his adopted mother have been burned at the stake, Michael goes into hiding for three days. It is now day 254, March 3rd, 2018. Michael arrives at the Church of Satan, yes, the Satanist church, and seeks community there, and he claims that he is the Antichrist to them, and one of them, I don't know her name, takes him under her wing, gives him shelter. We jump down about a month to April 5th. It is now day 287. One of the Satanists that takes him in directs him to Kineros, Kineros Robotics, I'm not exactly sure, to build him, his mom, again, in robot form, because they can just make a robotic copy of a person. We also learn that Miss Venable is working at this robotics company and is the assistant of these two, except this time she's wearing an orange ponytail wig that looks atrocious. We skip down to day 470. It is now April 5th, 2018. Jeff and Mutt are able, yes, the, that is these two fuckheads' names that I keep pointing to, Jeff and Mutt. They are able to create this robot after months. That allows Michael to program her to do his every wish. And that's where we leave episode eight, one of my absolute least favorite episodes. <laughs> So it is now day 626, March 10th, 2019. Michael has hired none other than Dinah Stevens to help him get into the witch's school. So Dinah betrays the witches. Mm -hmm. Miss Mead arrives with her assault rifle gun arm that she has. She starts shooting the fuck out of these girls. Queenie, Zoe, all the other flop characters that don't have names, all dead. The only ones that are able to make it out of this are Myrtle, Cordelia, Madison, Mallory, and Coco. They end up going to uh, Misty's old house, which by the way, where the fuck is Misty? She literally got resurrected in episode five. The only thing they say for the rest of the season is that she's off gallivanting with Stevie Nicks. I want her in the plot. Where the fuck was she? Cordelia comes up with the bright idea to have Mallory try to go back in time, which is the only thing that can really be done at this point to do a little test run to see if she can really do it. And we get a scene of July 17th, 1918, an infamous day where the Russian princess Anna Anastasia Romanoff, who is apparently a witch in this universe, I don't know how that makes sense, uses a protection spell to try and save her family from getting executed. However, Mallory travels back in time to that date to try and save Anastasia, but is unable to, and the spell breaks apart, and Mallory comes back to the present day. So that test was really for nothing, to be honest. We then skip down about a week. It is now day 632. 
March 16th, 2019. So we have Jeff and Mutt who introduce Michael to the cooperative, who is quite literally just the Illuminati, by the way. And he tells them his plan to eradicate the world and gives them instruction manuals on how to survive the apocalypse. We also learn that Michael around this time has killed Behold and John Henry Moore. John Henry Moore for the second time, by the way. Yeah, so everybody here is now dead. We skip down to day 709. It is June 1st, 2019. Jeff and Mutt make Venable the head of Outpost 3 when they see how well she's doing as their assistant. And that's basically where episode 9 ends. Let's get on into the very awful finale. <laughs> So the camera is quite far away, but this is the completed timeline of this season. It goes all the way down to the bottom of the board. We begin on day 895. It is December 4th, 2019. Myrtle arrives at the robotics facility and sees the plans of the apocalypse from these two and gets Coco St. Pierre Vanderbilt's family to get a spot in Outpost 3. So that is all her doing. She was able to use her powers to manipulate these two to open up four spots for Coco, Mallory, and these two. This same day, this same day, Myrtle returns to the hideout. This is where they plan on erasing Coco and Mallory's memories, and they do just that. So they erase these two's memories. They are given new memories where they are no longer best friends and they hate each other, and she is her servant. Madison pretends to be their Uber driver and gets them to an appointment with Gallant. We cut back all the way down after the apocalypse, where Mallory's powers awaken and she sets the room on fire when she's getting interviewed by Michael. Do you remember that? That was in episode three. Because Mallory's powers have awakened her, they have also somehow awakened these three who buried themselves in Louisiana mud prior to the apocalypse to like prevent them from getting sick. I don't know how the fuck that makes any sense. And we are all caught up now. We get back down to episode three where Michael is on the staircase with Mead and they're having a showdown with the six witches up here. Obviously, minus Dinah Stevens because she has sided with Michael. Cordelia then reveals to Dinah that they won't need Dinah's help anyway because she got the better version of Dinah, Miss Marie Laveau, to be resurrected by Papa Legba in return for Dinah's life. And so Dinah trades places with Marie Laveau. We also see a very small cameo from Delphine Lalaurie, but I forgot to put her on the board. So just now we see her in this season, but it's like literally like a five second scene. Marie Laveau has come back to life. She is there to help Myrtle, Cordelia, Madison, Mallory, and Coco take Michael down. Cordelia uses a spell to make Mead malfunction and explode. And in this chaos, Madison grabs the gun off of Mead's arm and uses it to shoot him repeatedly, which temporarily kills him for a bit. He resurrects himself and then blows her head off. So Madison is dead. Mm -hmm. He kills Madison. And as Myrtle and Cordelia take Mallory upstairs to try and do the time travel spell again, she is found by Brock, mm -hmm, the flop who's still alive somehow, and he stabs her. Mm and she's barely hanging on for dear life. Meanwhile, um, downstairs, Michael is walking up the stairs. He is greeted by Marie Laveau, who creates a barrier so that he cannot pass. However, he passes right away, and uh, he tears her heart out and then eats it. He ends up getting up the stairs after killing Coco, and really at this point, the witches are out of luck because of Brock, who Myrtle um, sets on fire and kills. So this is just a bunch of chaos at this point. They try to do the spell upstairs and Mallory fails. Mm -hmm. She fails. So Michael makes it up the stairs. Cordelia realizes that there's only one thing left to do. So she grabs a knife and stabs herself. Oh my goodness, what a twist. She stabs herself in the chest to let her power flow into Mallory and that allows Mallory to complete the spell to travel back in time. Michael watches as Mallory Mallory travels back in time. So we skip all the way back up to October 10th, 2015. It is again the day that Constance is having none of Michael's, you know, homicidal tendencies. It is right before she goes into the murder house to kill herself. Michael storms out of his house before 
she leaves to go kill herself. And in the most anticlimactic way possible, Mallory hits Michael with her car about 17 times, and that somehow is enough to kill him. So you're meaning to tell me that you spent the entire season building this up, and it's just, it's just a hit and run? There's no powers, it's just a hit, it's just a hit and run situation. That was a choice for sure. So Michael dies in 2015 in this alternate universe. Mallory does not return to the present day. She stays in 2015 and reunites with Cordelia, who doesn't remember her, by the way, because she arrived at the Academy in 2017 and at least in the alternate universe. By the way, everything under this line no longer exists. Everything under October 10th, 2015 no longer exists because Mallory killed Michael, which undid everything. The apocalypse never happened. The murder house episode never happened. Mead never found Michael. All the girlies in the murder house, they still have unfinished business with each other. Tate is no longer with Violet. Moira never moved on. Madison was never resurrected. Queenie never went to the Hotel Cortez because Mallory stopped her from going because she knew the exact date. The only thing that really did stay the same was Misty was resurrected by Mallory because apparently since Mallory was able to kill the Antichrist, she was able to bring someone back with her and that just happened to be Misty. Myrtle was never resurrected either, apparently, because she got resurrected in 2016. This is kind of a mess. It's kind of a huge gigantic mess. And then we get the absolutely worst ending you could possibly think of, which is the exact same ending as Murder House. Mm -hmm. It is. And so we see in 2020, in this alternate universe, now that none of this has happened, absolutely nothing below 2015, the cooperative, if you remember them, the Illuminati, they chose Emily and Timothy for a specific reason. And it was because their genes, when matched together, would make another Antichrist baby in case something were to happen to Michael. So they end up meeting each other somehow in real life in this alternate universe. They get married, and by 2024, they have a little toddler named Devin. October 11th, 2024, Devin kills his babysitter, and Mead and the Black Pope arrive to take him into their care. Mm -hmm. So quite literally the exact same ending as Murder House, but with these two fucking flop characters that we don't give a fuck about. That is where Apocalypse ends. If you have questions, so do I, because I don't know what the fuck is going on half the time in this season. Why would you start your story in 2020, do a one year time skip in episode one, to 2021, do the next two episodes in 2021, and then go all the way back to 2017 pre-apocalypse and have the next like seven to eight episodes explore 2017, 2018, and 2019 before returning in the finale to 2021, and then have one of your characters go back in time to before any of it took place just to erase everything you just tried to do there. In the worst way possible, by the way. That's just a question I have, personally. When I first watched this, I was much younger, by the way. This was the first season I actually watched live. I actually loved it at the time. Uh, upon a second rewatch, I was absolutely horrified because it was one of the worst things I've ever seen. I am so sorry if this made no sense. I did my absolute best to make sense of this. It could also be partially wrong. I do know that the dates regarding 2015 and beforehand are correct, and then the dates in 2020 and 2021 are correct. Everything else is merely a guess. Merely a guess. 2017 to 2019, that whole era, so like the majority of the season, merely a guess. I have absolutely no idea if it's actually when that takes place or not. I'm gonna go ahead and go because this has been quite an exhausting season to get through. And I think you can tell that based on how frustrated I am with this fuck ass plot. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and go. Leave a like down below and maybe comment down below what you thought about this season because I know that there are some people who do like it. I'm gonna get going. I will see you guys in the next video.